Thank you. That concludes the Minister's statement. I apologise to those members I was not able to take, but I think I had made it clear how things were progressing uh, and could not have been clearer in that regard. Uh, we will now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on Motion 6374 in the name of Elena Whittam on behalf of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee on robbing Peter to pay Paul, low income and the debt trap. I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Elena Whittam to speak to and to move the motion on behalf of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. Up to nine minutes, please, Ms Whittam. Deputy Presiding Officer, as convener, I am pleased to be opening this debate on the Social Justice and Social Security Committee's important inquiry into low income and debt. YouGov research commissioned by Citizens Advice Scotland found that over 600,000 people have encountered new debt problems during the pandemic, either getting into debt for the first time or seeing existing debt get worse. And with the cost crisis, it is likely that we will see these numbers grow exponentially. As the cost of basics rise sharply and energy prices skyrocket, households across the country are limiting their use of essentials and suffering a significant decline in their mental and physical well-being. People are desperately worried about the future, and we as a committee share their concerns. Spiralling costs will push an increasing number of people into debt because they simply do not have enough money to pay for all basic outgoings and bills. And as a committee, we set out to explore specific challenges faced by people with low income in accessing and finding solutions to their debt situation. We wanted to find out their key challenges and how we could help them. What more could be done? Our starting point for this work was the focus group with people experiencing debt problems. We wanted their experience to be at the heart of the inquiry and to inform the scope of, their work, of this work. Their testimony shaped the questions posed in our call for views and the committee's subsequent evidence-taking sessions. And what a stark picture they painted. Despite receiving advice on social security entitlement and other forms of income maximisation, many people on low income simply did not have enough money to make essential living costs. They were stuck in an inevitable cycle of debt operating with deficit budgets. And there was no obvious way out. Bankruptcy might be a short-term solution for some. However, for many, money advisors spent significant time trying to negotiate reduced payments with public sector creditors or accessing charitable support, with the sole aim of enabling their clients to have enough money to live. Participants from our original focus group formed our Experts by Experience panel, who made recommendations to the committee on how things could be improved. These recommendations fed directly into the committee's report. For us, this was about empowering people not just to tell us their story, but to be involved in shaping change. In fact, the report title, Robbing Peter to Pay Paul, Low Income and the Debt Trap, is also a quote taken directly from one of our experts by experience. And I would like to thank each and every one of them who gave evidence to the committee, particularly our experts by experience, who diligently engaged with us throughout this work. This wouldn't have been possible also without the organisations who supported them, and the committee extends its sincere thanks to all of you. During this inquiry, we were told problem debt has a particular stigma and shame attached to it that leaves people feeling trapped, isolated, unable to sleep. Many of these worries are related to wider stigma around poverty. Deputy Presiding Officer, this was a far-reaching inquiry with recommendations that span a number of different Scottish Government portfolios as well as local government and UK government responsibilities. We looked at debt owed to schools through school meals, council tax debt, the advice sector, the availability of information and support, early intervention and prevention, mental health and statutory debt solutions such as bankruptcy. And I hope that a range of these areas will be touched on by my colleagues today, but in my remaining time I will focus on just two of the key areas we explored, public sector debt and money advice. Often when we think of debt, we think of debt owed to private businesses like credit cards and loans. Increasingly we might think about debt owed to fuel costs. We may not think so quickly about the role of public sector plays in debt in areas such as social housing, benefit deductions, council tax, care charges, and school charges. We were told that debt owed to public bodies is increasing as people struggle to pay bills. Collection of this debt can be quicker and harsher than from private creditors. Failure to pay council tax can result in enforcement action. Cass highlighted that council tax debt is one of the biggest debts that they see in bureaus. Local authorities tend to favour favour bank investments as a way of enforcing payment. This means that money can be seized directly from people's bank accounts. 
Steps have been taken to bring greater consistency, consistency to local authority debt collection, but we heard that this is not always felt on the ground. We were concerned to hear that public sector processes are not always sensitive enough to, to individual circumstances. Our experts by experience stress that compassion must be built into these processes and services. We can't have rigid, faceless um, services that always assume that the debtor is wrong. This makes the whole experience work worse for the individual and adds anxiety. We need a fundamental change in attitude from frontline services dealing with people in debt. We believe the public sector should aim to lead by best practice by handling debt in a fair and more considerate way. Debt recovery should, not be, done, should be done proportionately based on individual circumstances and people should be treated with compassion. We were also concerned to hear that people are sometimes failed by clunky systems which are not connected or easy to use. People must take it upon themselves to navigate complex systems to get the support they're entitled to, often at times where they have very limited emotional and financial capacity to do so. The burden of responsibility falls on individuals too often, and this is a theme that emerges often in our committee work. Before I return to the role of the free money sector, um, advice sector, I want to touch on school meals as another important area where quick action could be taken. Free school meal provision should be increased and rolled out at pace, and school me meal debt should be written off. This is already happening in some councils, but not all. And as I said during my debate on Challenge Poverty Week, Wayne's need to eat. Last but no, by, by no means least, I turn to the advice sector and the people across Scotland who are working tirelessly to help people who are existing in truly desperate circumstances. Money advisors are doing a hugely difficult but important job in helping people to navigate their finances. And they may be suffering their own financial and wellbeing challenges in the process. Debt advisors told us that they are firefighting and they are hanging on by their fingertips. They are burnt out by the demand on their services. The complexity of cases and the lack of available options to resolve people's problems. Witnesses raised issues around about the awareness of advice services, stigma around seeking help, channel choice and digital exclusion, as well as funding concerns. Christians Against Poverty shared an example with us of one of the many people they support through their debt advice. This client is coming to the end of a minimal assets process bankruptcy. Their sole income is social security benefits. They suffer from depression, anxiety and panic attacks. Once they have been discharged from bankruptcy, they will have £8.55 a week to live on for all food and household items. Living on a budget of, of £8.55 is not sustainable, and the very tragic reality is that this individual will fall straight back into problem debt. Debt advisors also highlighted that many low-income households are the most prudent money managers you will ever come across. They know where every single penny goes and can account from every part of their income. The problem is that the income is simply not enough to cover the costs. We must continue to use all available avenues to tackle poverty and resulting debt issues, and we must take a person-centred approach. I am proud of the committee's inquiry and the work it has undertaken to shine a light on the complex circumstances that lead people to become indebted and their struggle to find solutions to that debt. This is systemic and interlinking challenges of tackling poverty were interwoven in this work. We make a wide range of recommendations which we think could make a real difference to people who are the most marginalised and overwhelmed by their debt. Those whose incomes are so low that there can seem to be no feasible way to pay off debt and no way out of the debt trap. I hope that the Scottish Government, the UK Government and local authorities recognise the compelling evidence received by the Committee on these issues and work together to enact the much-needed collective change. On behalf of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee, I move that the Parliament notes the conclusions and recommendations contained in the Social Justice and Social Security Committee's 8th Report 2022, Session 6, Robin Peter, to pay Paul, Paul low income and the debt trap. And I did all of that having a menopausal hot flush. Yes, <laughs> go me. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Ms Whittam. I look forward to seeing you back at the, uh, at the members' business uh, later on this afternoon. Um, before we move to the next speaker, can I encourage those who haven't already done so to press the request to speak buttons uh, as soon as possible? And I call on Gillian Martin to speak on behalf of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee for around four minutes. Ms Martin. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Social Justice and Social, Social Security uh, Committee for bringing the debate to the Chamber today. And earlier this year, the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee completed its initial inquiry into health inequalities in Scotland, and the rising cost of living inevitably impacted on our evidence. 
And Scotland has got enduring health inequalities, the result in good part from a number of historic factors outlined by several experts that we heard from. And we found that health inequalities increased across the population during the years leading up to the pandemic, and then the pandemic exacerbated them. And we heard that destitution rose during the pandemic, and people from black and minority ethnic communities and disabled people were more likely to die and that caring responsibilities became almost insurmountable and caused mental health issues. Now, this isn't a debate about health inequalities, but the inescapable fact is that poverty is the root cause of health inequalities, and the rapid rise in the cost of living is set to worsen long-term health inequalities if action isn't taken. And during our inquiry, we heard that a number of households where spending exceeds incomes is rapidly increasing. And it's a, a phrase that we hear a lot, but the reality is that people are choosing to, uh, between eating and heating, and this is inf uh, impacting more and more families. People with complex conditions or those who provide informal care have additional costs with often very little income. And we heard that people with multiple sclerosis, for example, will face an additional £200 per week on average on, in electricity and gas bills. And we also heard that some families have extensive medical equipment to power. Medi many medical and mobility devices require charging or constant electricity to function. And members will be aware of the recent coverage of a family facing an expected £17,000 energy bill to keep their daughter with cerebral palsy uh, warm and alive. The rest of the family will freeze to ensure that she can have heat in her room. Many people with disabilities or reduced mobility um, must have their heating at higher levels to stay warm and prevent them from becoming seriously ill. And people also told us during our inquiry that they had to stop social and recreational activities due to the increased costs. And we and our predecessor committees have advocated for the importance of physical activity, social interaction and participating in social and cultural activities as a way to prevent ill health. And without being able to do these activities or afford to do these activities, physical and mental health suffers and social isolation increases. We heard of people being able, able to un attend health and social care services and stopping self-management because of financial hardship. We heard of pensioners being pushed into extreme fuel poverty. And we heard that as a result of the cost of living crisis, that child, with all, uh, despite all the interventions that were made by the Scottish Government, child poverty is on the rise. So the poorest and most vulnerable people in society are those that are bearing the brunt of this crisis. And they can get uh, significantly worse for a lot of households. Professor Sir Michael Marmot told us that inflation has a much bigger impact on households with low incomes than it does on households with higher incomes. And that seems, seems self-evident. But um, you know, it's, it's not just an exercise in, in, in philosophy. This it's actually making a real difference, and it's pushing people that, ha that live in the margins of their um, income into poverty, and thus widening health inequalities. It was laid bare to our committee. We were told that people in the poorest communities are quite li literally dying because of inequalities, poverty, and repeated challenges they're facing. Professor Jerry McCartney told us plainly that the rising mortality of our poorest communities will get worse and they will get worse faster if those challenges are not addressed properly. We are left in no doubt the cost of living crisis and the urgent public health and social justice emergency. And as a committee, we have re recommended targeted action to address health inequalities, including tackling underlying inequality and poverty as its root cause at all levels, local government, Scottish government and UK government. There is action needed at all levels, and it is needed now, or we will be looking at widening health inequalities for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Martin. I now call on Siobhan Brown to uh, speak on behalf of the COVID-19 recovery. Again, around four minutes. Uh, Thank Brown. you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is my pleasure to speak in this debate as convener of the COVID-19 Recovery Committee on such an important topic, and I commend the Social Justice and Social Security Committee for bringing this debate to the Chamber. I will shortly be talking about some of the Committee's work within the context of the cost crisis, but first, it is important to stress that the impact of the cost crisis is a cross-cutting issue affecting everyone. Today's debate is an excellent opportunity to highlight parliamentary committee's scrutiny on this issue, which is very welcome. Like other committees, we have just completed our pre-budget scrutiny and wrote to the Deputy First Minister last week with our recommendations, which included calling on the Scottish Government to clarify 
whether the cost crisis will affect the funding of the COVID recovery strategy. As members are aware, the strategy was published in October 2021, well before the scale of the cost crisis was apparent. And during evidence, we heard how the impact of the cost crisis could affect the funding and delivery of the strategy, with stark warnings that it will pose more significant challenges for organisations, service providers and individuals than even those faced during the pandemic. Now, we know that the Scottish Government's budget is roughly 1.7 billion less than it was worth last December. And if we ask whether the government intends to ref we ask whether the government intends to refresh the strategy to reflect any policy changes in light of the cost crisis. On a similar vein, at the recent convener's group meeting, I asked the First Minister whether the government's priorities for recovery had changed in light of the cost crisis and she confirmed its aims and objectives for recovery had not changed, but that the context had. And the First Minister spoke of the importance of focusing on inequalities made worse by the pandemic and the cost crisis, particularly on ethnic minorities and those who are less well off. In your report, you looked at bankruptcy and digital exclusion, amongst many other things, and many, both areas being impacted by the, by the cost crisis. These are areas which this committee considered as part of our scrutiny on the COVID recovery and reform bill. To put simply, the bill was introduced to make permanent some provisions that were introduced through the emergency COVID legislation in relation to public health and public service reform, which covered the remote delivery of per public services. And the aim was to retain some service improvements brought in, which were brought in during the pandemic and support resilience against any future public health threats. We heard the experiences of delivering public services remotely, including increased flexibilities and resource savings. However, witness, witnesses highlighted some of the barriers to accessibility which exist for some users. And the committee re recommended that the bill be amended to ensure all local authorities provide a choice of remote or in-person services, including the provision of hard copy documents when required. We also looked at the bankruptcy provisions in the bill. And before I go on, it's worth explaining that people can only be forced into bankruptcy by the creditors if they owe above a certain amount of money. And emergency COVID legislation increased the debt threshold at which a creditor could make someone bankrupt to protect people from harsh outcomes during the pandemic. And the bill set it permanently at a higher rate. The committee heard mixed views on what the debt threshold level should be and noted that the cost crisis has escalated considerably since the bill was introduced. The government subsequently acknowledged the need to keep this threshold under review, particularly in light of the current economic situation. Turning to our future work, we are about to look at the impact of COVID on the long on the labour market specifically focused on long-term sick component of economically inactive people, as well as people who have chosen early retirement. And I'm sure issues relating to the cost crisis are bound to come up over the course of this inquiry. Presiding officer, just to finish, as with the COVID itself, this issue is a complex one and it's not going to go away anytime soon. It's an area which requires action from both the UK government and the Scottish government, as has been previously mentioned. And this debate today highlights a strong parliamentary scrutiny being done to ensure we can respond appropriately, appropriately to the fiscal pressures that we all face. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ms. Brown. I can advise the Chamber we've got a little bit of time in hand, so anybody taking interventions will get that uh, time back for the first year. And with that, I call the Cabinet Secretary for around nine minutes. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Uh, I'm very grateful to Alina Whittam um, and her committee for the substantial work on this inquiry and want to thank the individuals and organisations that took the time to give evidence on the issues that are affecting people and how governments can target their efforts to help those most in need. I also want to thank um, Gillian uh, 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 Martin and uh, Siobhan uh, Brown for the contribution from their uh, committees uh, also. The continuing negative impact of Brexit alongside the current cost of living crisis have pushed households into hardship and I am acutely aware of that. Those pressures have been made worse by the recent economic uh, mayhem that the UK government has caused over the past few weeks, and this has all exacerbated existing inequalities and financial stress even further than when the committee published their report and we provided our response on the actions that we are taking and the plans uh, for the future. The committee's recommendations raise a, a number of issues which span a, 
wide range of policy areas uh, and local Scottish and UK government responsibilities. And within our limited powers and finite uh, budget, the Scottish Government is already addressing many of the recommendations in their inquiry report. And we'll continue to work across government as well as with partners, including COSLA, to improve the response to and the services available for those experiencing uh, problem debt. Households are facing the most uh, severe economic upheaval in a generation, with alarming rises in energy bills, food prices and inflation rates undoubtedly hitting those on the lowest incomes the hardest. The Scottish Government's budget is not immune uh, to those same economic shocks, and as the Deputy First Minister set out last month, our budget is now worth uh, around £1.7 billion less than when it was set in December because of increasing inflation. Yet, in stark contrast to, to the UK Government, the Scottish Government has taken sustained and significant action to tackle poverty. We have allocated almost £3 billion this year for support that will help mitigate the impact of increasing costs on households, over a billion pounds of which is only available in Scotland. So, through free childcare, uh, bus travel, prescriptions, uh, eye tests, dental checkups, and period products, we are supporting households in all areas of life through a range of actions, all supporting people through the crisis and beyond. And putting a total of £150 million in the pockets of low-income families through bridging payments over this year and last is also direct cash support to households now and in direct response to the additional pressure families are facing this winter. We are also doubling the December payment for eligible families. Uh, yes, of course. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, one of the things that was hoped would be there would be seven, P7 free meals provided in this financial year, which has been delayed by, I think, at least one year. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that next academic year, every child in Scotland who goes to P7 will have a free school meal? As Cabinet Jeremy Secretary. Balfour will be aware, the free school meal provision in Scotland is way in excess of anywhere else on these islands, particularly uh, in England, where his party is in power. Um, in res direct response, the Pupils um, that are already receiving uh, uh, free school meals in primary one to five is saving parents £400 per eligible child per year. And we are continuing to work with our partners and local authorities to plan for the expansion uh, to primary six and seven. And that's being supported by £30 million of capital investment to support uh, that expansion. So we will get on uh, with supporting uh, families in uh, as many ways as we can. Uh, actions showing that the Scottish Government will always do what it can to help those in need and take action to tackle child poverty, reduce inequalities and help households maximise their money uh, through up to uh, £86 million this year in discretionary housing payments. We are fully mitigating the bedroom tax for 91,000 households supporting tenancies and reducing the chances of getting into debt and rent arrears. And we have now committed to additional funding to mitigate the benefit cap as far as we are able for up to 4,000 families. A clear commitment in our Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan and an example of our track record of using all of the powers available to us to soften the blow of the worst of the UK Government's policy decisions. And of course, we also recently announced that local authorities can use their DHP's budgets to support households with energy bills, with an additional £5 million committed for this. Financial pressures are, almost, are often felt most acutely by people who rent their home. And that's why we took action through the Tenant Protection Act, which came into force last week, to help tenants through the challenging months ahead by freezing rents and preventing evictions. And of course, President Officer, when people are in need of a safety net, our Scottish social security system, built upon the principles of fairness, dignity and respect, provide 12 benefits, seven of which are unique to Scotland. In just over a week, our package of five family payments will be worth over £10,000 for eligible families by the time their first child turns six. And this includes the Scottish Child Payment, which we doubled to £20 per week per child in April, and will, of course, increase again to £25 when we extend it to under 16 so on the 14th of November. That is a 150% rise within eight months and way ahead of anything available anywhere else in these islands. In addition, our child winter heating assistance supports the uh, the families of almost 20,000 severely disabled children and young people with payments totalling around £4 million each year. 
This year's payment of £214.10 is already reaching people. And again, this is a Scottish benefit only available to those in Scotland, as is our new winter heating payment, which will pl replace the UK cold weather payments. And this guaranteed £50 uh, annual payment will be paid from next February to around 400,000 low-income households, and that is backed by £20 million of investment and is guaranteed help for winter fuel bills for thousands of people in need. Yes. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for taking the intervention. And I know what the Cabinet Secretary has said on the child winter heating assistance, but does the Cabinet Secretary agree that disabled people over the age of 16 also face increased fuel costs? And what can the Scottish Government do to support those families? Cabinet Secretary, good Well, we back. do recognise that. And of course, um, many of the things I've already talked about will help. Uh, people with uh, disabled uh, family members um, and, of course, the Scottish Welfare Fund uh, also that we fund um, is available to, to families uh, with someone with a disability. And, of course, we will continue to look at what more we can do, but that is within the context of a very constrained financial uh, outlook. But, uh, as I say, we continue to look at what more we uh, can do. And we are already uh, spending £460 million above the level of funding we receive um, uh, from the UK Government in terms of benefit expenditure, um, and that is uh, substantial. Uh, President Officer, we are doing uh, much more to uh, support people. We are also leading the way with the provision of the most generous universal free school meal provision in the UK, so that our children are not hungry in school and can focus on learning. We also continue to provide funding for local authorities across Scotland for schemes such as the Council Tax Reduction Scheme, the Scottish Welfare Fund that I just mentioned, and, and can help to, that helps uh, provide much needed support to vulnerable households. Furthermore, we are the only part of the UK to have a statutory debt repayment scheme, bringing important protections for those taking control of their debt. And we have taken action on the protected minimum balance that can be retained in relation to a bank arrestment, on which uh, the Minister uh, will say uh, more later. Presiding officer, we recognise that sometimes financial difficulties can overwhelm people. And at those most difficult times, advice services play a vital role in helping people to understand what they are entitled to and what their rights are. And that is why we have allocated £12.5 million this year to advice services, including debt, welfare and, and income maximisation advice. And over the past four years, our Money Talk uh, service team has put um, just over £47 million into the pockets of almost 21,500 people. And we have also committed to an additional £1.2 million package to enable the expansion of energy advice services. And of course, that is in addition to our welfare advice uh, practitioners within GP practices um, that are helping uh, people uh, um, uh, when they go to see uh, a health professional. Um, I will uh, close, uh, Deputy President. I can give you a bit, a bit more time. Oh, right. Well, that would be extremely helpful. Uh, thank you. Uh, I should also say that we have tried to bring all of this information into one place, because we know trying to find out what people are entitled to uh, can be challenging. That is why we have recently launched a cost of living website, which provides trusted advice to help people understand the significant range uh, available. That is on the Scottish Government's uh, website. Um, we are acutely aware of the growing impact on low-income households of debts to the public sector, uh, as was mentioned by Elena Whittam. Um, and of course, local authorities uh, have powers to write off arrears, and we continue to encourage them to share good practice on debt assistance and collection, and to show empathy and dignity when working with people uh, struggling uh, with debts. And of course, presiding officer, uh, in conclusion, uh, the UK government holds many of the levers that would lift households out of poverty, and I remain deeply concerned about their long-standing approach to social security. And whilst we are using all of our powers available to us to support households where we can, including uprating our benefits, uh, the social impacts of real terms cuts to UK government benefits are significant, with more people on a low income being driven into poverty or deeper poverty. And I would absolutely urge the UK government uh, to reflect on that when they come to uh, their uh, budget statement. Um, and we cannot have further austerity inflicted by uh, this UK government. And as the First Minister told the Prime Minister last week, the UK government holds the levers over energy, tax, the bulk of benefits, along with business support and regulation that could help address this crisis and support household 
public bodies and indeed uh, businesses uh, going forward. So we have called on the UK Government for an inflationary uplift to the 2022-23 budget to enable the Scottish Government to take further steps to support people with the cost of living crisis, provide fair public sector pay uplifts and support public services given the fiscal constraints on devolution. I just want to thank again the committee for this comprehensive report and thank them for bringing this debate to the Chamber to allow us to shine a light on all of these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Miles Briggs for around eight minutes. Mr Briggs. Thank you, Deputy Signing Officer. And can I also start by thanking all those who contributed to the work of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee inquiry and also the helpful briefings uh, which organisations have provided us ahead of today's debate. It is vital that we understand challenges being faced by people on low incomes and the debt problems often that drives, particularly in the context of the global cost of living crisis which we are seeing and the results of that, placing more and more people further into debt and that accompanying uh, misery as well. Prior to the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, it was estimated that 600,000 people were in debt in Scotland. The real problem is that the pandemic has not only exasperated money problems for people in Scotland, but it's also now driving them as well. And across the UK, cost of living has been increasing since 2021. In September of this year, inflation rose by to a 40-year high of 10.1%. Now, naturally, it is those on the lowest income, lowest income households, who are affected the worst by that increase in inflation. High food and energy prices are among the consequences of high demand from consumers supply chain issues and I think most importantly as well we need to recognise uh, the fallout from the war in Ukraine as well. Those living on low incomes are more likely to be in debt with around half of low to middle income households having at least one debt compared to uh, less than two in five for higher income households. And one of the key messages which came out of the inquiry and from those with lived experience um, was the role I think which um, advice services have to play and early intervention can and must also provide and the role local authorities play in supporting and providing that advice uh, to low-income individuals and families was important. Cutting council budgets and services harms the poorest in our society. That's something I think this parliament sometimes doesn't recognise enough. COSLA have already warned that further cuts to council budgets and services um, will see uh, the removal of services for the most vulnerable in our society. Yes, happy to. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I mean, doesn't the funding of all of our public services, whether it's local government or when it's NHS, really depend on the decisions that are made in the forthcoming financial statement? And if what is to be believed of deep public sector cuts comes from his government, is that not the biggest threat to public services, whether it's local government or anywhere else? I suppose we have to, thank you. I suppose we have to look at the history of this and the fact that the Scottish Government um, have the highest budget in the history of devolution, yet decided to cut council budgets, shows where this Government's priorities have been and the consequences that has. But those likely to experience poverty and debt are amongst those most marginalised in our communities. People with disabilities are most likely to face the highest excess costs in the UK with one in five disabled people and one in four uh, families with disabled children facing extra costs, now estimated to be around um, more than £1,000 a month. Other gr groups, including women, young parents, people living in rural areas, um, were also highlighted to the committee. More needs to be done to ensure these groups are provided with equal opportunities in order to stop them disproportionately being affected by debt as well. And it is concerning, I think, that ministers have... If I... If we've got time in hand. Yep. You've got time in hand. Yep. Eleanor Whittam. Thank you. I, I thank you for taking the intervention. Just wondering round about, you mentioned um, young parents there. Do you not agree that the UK government's DWP policy on how young parents under 25 are treated in terms of their, their welfare provision actually you know, exacerbates the poverty that those young parents are facing? Well, yeah, I agree with the member on that, and as I've said in committee, that's something I hope can be looked at by the UK government around this. I think that's something we've heard evidence needs to change. So, yeah, happy to accept that. And that's where um, those with lived experience, I think, really have provided the committee with um, a lot of key uh, thinking and areas we need to take forward. But there's a lot this parliament and councils need to be doing to change, and that's uh, what I want to focus on 
um, in terms of our role here, because it is also important and incredibly concerning, I believe, that SNP and Green Ministers have now targeted employability schemes for some of the largest budget cuts without any information on the impact or indeed providing assurances around what these schemes will, be, will look like and whether or not they will uh, be restarted. I think that is something we need to uh, make sure Ministers um, really monitor and look at uh, the unintended consequences around as well. Um, SNP and Green Ministers have in the past also highlighted, and it was uh, highlighted by uh, Siobhan Bryan from her committee, uh, digital exclusion. And I don't think we've seen enough around that for people living in poverty in rural communities where advice services are not necessarily local, but accessing them and the online services which uh, are provided um, by many charities across the country needs to um, be improved. So that's something I think uh, which hasn't been necessarily touched upon, we need to see action on as well. Ultimately, though, we need to see action from every level of government. Um, we need to see our local councils properly resourced to be able to play their role in this, uh, but also both governments working together in this area to, drive, uh, to deliver on the targets which we all signed up to. Specifically, for example, around child poverty, Parliament has previously debated the need for more to be done uh, to tackle the issue of child poverty in Scotland, something that the Audit Scotland uh, report in September uh, pointed towards a need for a better strategic uh, planning approach uh, by Scottish Government. Um, they concluded that SNP ministers need to focus on a more long-term strategy to prevent children from falling into poverty. Now, all of us agree it is not acceptable in 21st, Scotland, 21st century Scotland to see the numbers of children living in poverty. Uh, but how we work together across government to deliver on that is important. I also make no apology uh, for the fact that the number of children still living in temporary accommodation is increasing, especially here in the capital. Um, the Scottish Government are simply not doing enough to provide the resources to councils to help prevent that or to rethink policy around that area. It's something I've asked the Cabinet Secretary uh, to act upon previously, and we, we've seen the situation getting worse, not better. Now, an area where the committee heard the greatest difference can be made is around access to free school meals, and the Cabinet Secretary touched upon this uh, earlier as well. I don't think we are seeing the agreed pro progress on delivering this policy. Um, at, when you look at the programme for government, there were clear commitments there which are now not being met. And I do hope that if anything comes out of this debate today, it is the need for leadership from the Scottish Government on that issue to deliver that promise. If Scottish ministers and local authorities take the same response we saw during the pandemic, for example, to this issue, then I believe the policy could be delivered now without further delay. Scottish Conservatives support the delivery of free school meals. We believe that all school children, primary school and special uh, school children, should be given free breakfast and lunch. And we also support continued provision for eligible children during school holidays as well. That is a crucial way, and we've seen the evidence around it, in preventing people on low incomes from dropping under the poverty line and ensuring children from the most deprived backgrounds are cared for and receive access to nutritional food. And that's something we have all signed up to, but we need to see that focus on delivering it. I hoped we would have seen it uh, before this winter. Now, I'd also call on the Cabinet Secretary to make that happen. You know, the Cabinet Secretary could chair a free school meals delivery group with COSLA to drive that policy to be delivered before Christmas. And I hope that's something she will take on board and consider. Um, Presiding officer, yesterday I visited FedCap Scotland in Livingston to learn more about the employability support schemes they are providing. I was hugely impressed with the work they are doing and the support which is being uh, genuinely taken forward to provide that person-centred approach. And we often talk about that, but what does that mean? And I think for many people who are furthest away from um, the employment market, it is also their mental uh, well-being which needs to be considered as well. So I was impressed with what they are doing, but I do think, and it's an area we won't have time to expand necessarily in this debate, but we also need to look, um, I think, going forward at generational unemployment in Scotland and what additional support can be given to families there. In conclusion, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer, if we aspire to be a just, fair Scotland, we must afford all our citizens fair and equal opportunities. The COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine are two of the chief reasons why we are now witnessing global cost of living increases and seeing more and more people in Scotland and across the UK falling into debt problems and also significant costs in uh, living costs. To deal with this, we want to see the Scottish Government, Westminster and local authorities working together to take on this unprecedented crisis and to try to deliver solutions for all our people. 
I hope that the actions and the recommendations of the report can be taken forward by local authorities and, importantly, the Scottish Government. There is a lot of good work in this report, and I look forward to making sure that, as a committee, we continue to pursue that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Briggs. Um, I would note that there have been um, a number of members coming in and out of the Chamber. I would remind the Chamber that uh, members who are participating in the debate should remain within the Chamber uh, for all of the opening speeches uh, and indeed for the closing speeches. And with that, I call Pam Duncan Glancy for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I want to open today by putting on record my thanks to the many organisations and people who gave evidence to Social Justice and Social Security Committee as part of our inquiry and who took the time to respond to the committee's call for written views. Hearing from representatives from local authorities, third sector organisations, tenants associations and advice services was an eye-opening experience. Charities like Shelter Scotland, Our Lower, the Anti-Child Poverty Action Group, One Parent Family Scotland all gave evidence, highlighting the breadth of the issue and the fact that people from all demographics and backgrounds are feeling the bite. I'm sure my committee colleagues will agree it was a stark reality check. People were struggling before the cost of living crisis. Citizens Advice Bureau requests for advice on debt almost doubled from 4% of total requests in May 2021 to 8% in May 2022. That was before the cost of bills began to skyrocket. Now, households across Scotland are facing prices rising at their fastest rate for 30 years. Not being able to keep up with bills can be the trigger for a downward spiral into severe problem debt. Without significant and urgent action from both the UK and the Scottish Government, bills will continue to rise and more people will be forced to take on debt just to cover their essential costs, including many who had never contemplated income insecurity before. The people on the margins, who were just about scraping by before, are now finding they have no space left to move. They have no financial resilience and they have no buffer to protect them against rising bills, nor the rising tide of poverty. Failure to act now and prevent more people falling into debt isn't just unacceptable, it's also bad economics. We know that debt causes financial insecurity, homelessness and mental health issues, all things that require state resources and intervention. Put simply, by allowing people to fall into problem debt, the governments are, are costing themselves, their future selves, more money. One money adviser told us that his advice web chat was the busiest after 10pm at night. People are lying awake in the early hours of the morning, searching for help, unable to sleep because they are so worried about being able to make ends meet. They are desperate for solutions. In many cases, they are reaching out before they are in debt. They can feel that they are being squeezed and pushed to the edge, and they are desperately seeking a way to budget better and to cut back where they can. But the reality is that for too many people, the choice is now about which essential bill not to pay. There is nowhere left to cut back and that they have not already sacrificed. Money advisors report that they have run out of options. They are struggling to help people budget when outgoings such as rent, council tax, heating and electricity eat up people's entire income streams, leaving nothing left over to pay debt, including for food and essentials or credit card bills or bank loans. One witness told committee, there is no resilience, there is no disposable income anywhere. We are now relying on charities to help such people out. I do not know how sustainable that will be for those charities. The third sector, as always, is stepping up in the absence of proper government action. The demand on it is increasing, yet the SNP government has cut its overall funding in the last budget by over a million pounds. I sincerely hope that it will choose not to repeat that mistake this year. Money advice services, too, are being pushed to breaking point, and they have made it clear that the more the, prob the, more the problem, gr problem grows, the harder they are finding it to prioritise those they support. Not long ago, I visited a Citizens Advice Bureau in Canvas Lang, which supports my constituents. I could not believe the amount of work they are having to do. They were rushed off their feet, and I want to take the opportunity to thank Sharon Hampson and her team at the Bureau and staff at CABS right across the country for the work that they are doing. Referrals to these services are increasing, yet there has been no increase in number of staff available to deal with it, which is exactly why Scottish Labour has called on more funding to be directed to those services. They are the last line of defence for many people, and we cannot leave them under-equipped. It is time the Scottish Government ensured the tools that are available to allow these services to deal with rising demand and in the long term. It cannot allow staff to burn out. 
The Scottish Government has powers to alleviate the suffering of soaring numbers of people in debt and distress on an under-resourced sector. It has a responsibility to do more to protect people, and the Committee's findings showed that it has powers to act in a number of areas which would address its effects in Scotland. In September 2019, the Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills pledged to take forward a wide-ranging review of Scotland's debt solutions. Almost three years later, following serious shocks to personal finances, it has not yet published its findings. The Scottish Government also promised a review of the Scottish Welfare Fund that that would commence in the first year of this Parliament, but we are still waiting, and it must expedite that given the current crisis. I will. Minister. I am very grateful to the Member Gifford for giving way. Just on the review of statutory debt solutions, as a member will be aware, this was in three phases. One was a an initial response to the crisis situation we faced in the pandemic, where recommendations were implemented. There were further recommendations which we took forward as part of the uh, coronavirus recovery um, legislation. We are considering further action. I am meeting stakeholders later this week um, on statutory debt solutions. The third aspect I will set out um, uh, in due course, but that is entailing a, a longer and wider and more comprehensive look at our statutory debt solutions landscape. But I would want to assure the member that uh, not only how are we taking forward actions from that um, process? Indeed, work has already been implemented and was indeed implemented during the pandemic. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Minister for the intervention and I acknowledge the work that that group has done so far. But as he acknowledged in, in his uh, intervention, that phase three um, is not yet set out in detail and we still don't know where that work is going to continue. And families are facing this crisis today. The Scottish Government also um, promised a review of the Scottish Welfare Fund and that that would commence in the first year of this Parliament, yet we are still waiting for that. And it must expedite this, I believe, given the current crisis. In doing so, it should consider mechanisms to speed up the turnaround times for crisis applications to allow for quicker decision-making. And at the moment, this takes around 48 hours, which is a long time if you are cold and hungry. Scottish Labour have repeatedly called for more funding to be directed towards this fund as well. The committee heard that the money currently available is being spent really quickly, as more and more people turn to crisis grants that there is simply not enough to go around. But these solutions are just sticking plasters. The Welfare Fund is meant to be an emergency lever, not the long-term answer to financial difficulty. Money advisers we spoke to were clear that people are using the Welfare Fund to cover the absolute basics. We can see that in the fact that over a third of applications are refused because they are repeat applications. If things continue as they are, it won't hold out for much longer, which is why we need to see the government take further action with the future in mind. One thing it could do would be to review the law around the amount of money sheriff officers are able to arrest from a person's account. The minimum protected balance currently stands at £1,000 as of today regardless of the source of income, which means people are even losing money that they receive specifically for childcare or housing costs via universal credit. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation estimate that a single person needs the equivalent of £1,768.53 take-home pay per month for a decent standard of living. Current rules mean that people, where people are having their money arrested, they could be left with just over half of that. That is before you even consider family circumstances or the potential additional costs of being a disabled person or having caring responsibilities. It is no wonder that people are finding themselves in perpetual crisis. The Government must consider making money advice a mandatory service to give the protection of long-term funding too. Not doing so means that an alarming number of staff are short-term funded, project funded and funded to deal with specific challenges, limiting those available to deal with a wider context and prevent forward planning because services are unable to be sure what future staffing levels will be. Scottish Labour are also strong advocates of the breathing space policy, which allows those facing mental health crisis to have, the sum, to have some time free of being chased by creditors, and we are disappointed that the Government did not acknowledge this in the response to the Committee's report. I would strongly urge it to reconsider this, and in doing so, note the impact of not doing so on mental health services in the NHS. The report we are discussing today went further in its recommendations, and I am proud of it, which I am sure my colleagues will speak to. And Scottish Labour are proud to give these recommendations our support. We note, however, that on many of them, the Government has suggested that they are working towards it. And so we look for a quick update from the Government on all of these areas. One of the areas was on school meal debt, and we have heard about that already. And I am proud that Scottish Labour-led South Lanarkshire Council has pushed ahead in the absence of Government leadership to wipe off this debt. The Government you, must you go further to encourage now, more local Lancy. authorities to follow suit. President officer, people can't wait any longer. What more will it take for the government to realise the gravity of the situation 
Too many people can't afford to pay their bills or put food on the table. They cannot afford to wait any longer. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to the open debate. I call first Emma Roddick to be followed by Morris Golden for around five minutes. Ms Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Though it honestly feels like just moments ago, it has been four months and almost as many Prime Ministers since the Social Justice and Social Security Committee published this report. Even as we carried out the inquiry, events were overtaking us and witnesses were having to react to news so much that I'm sure if I asked CPAG and Crisis today the same questions that I asked them during the inquiry, they would have a lot more to add. The cost of living crisis has undoubtedly deepened recently and an attack from UK Tories on the economy and people on low incomes has made worse a situation which called for action long ago. Instead of taking that action, the UK Government has ignored it, tanked the economy, putting interest and mortgage rates out of control and failed to act on skyrocketing fuel costs which have seen bills more than double, instead simply lining the pockets of energy companies. And that's what we're talking about here, is people trying to afford a roof over their heads, food and warmth. One constituent summed it up for me last week when she said, it's not even the cost of living. This isn't living. It's the cost of surviving. And before I get into the issues the report raises, I do want to reflect on the, the committee's work overall, because it's incredibly meaningful to me to work on the committee in this parliament, which deals with scrutinising policy aimed at tackling the worst things that I've been through personally. Having that lived experience myself, I know how important it is that we inform policy through lived experience, and I think it's right that we focus so much on this as a committee, hearing from individuals as well as organisations who help and represent them. It's often difficult to listen to their evidence, particularly from our experts by experience, some of whom were still living in a very difficult period in their lives when they spoke to us. And it's incredibly important that when we ask people to do that, tell strangers about what they've suffered, often with associated trauma, in the hope that it might change things, that we really do take action off the back of it. In Social Security, perhaps more than any other portfolio in government, it is clear that to go further as the SNP government and I and most here would like to do, we have to break free of the UK and its Tory government's string of harsh and punitive welfare policies. We heard consistently and clearly from witnesses throughout the inquiry how much of an impact harmful UK Tory policies like the two-child limit the cut to universal credit, the under-25 penalty, the list goes on, had on pushing them into poverty and keeping them there. The impact is huge. And when we announced that we were doubling the Scottish child payment, that news came at the same time as the announcement that the Tories were slashing universal credit. It was the largest overnight cut to welfare since World, for World War II. So we are fighting against the tide in this place, and every policy the Scottish Government brings forward to help people seems to be matched or even outdone by the Tories going the other way and ripping money out of the hands of those who need it. And I say this not just to have a pop at the Tory UK government, although I am happy to do so, but yes. Well, I'm grateful, like, a very negative speech she's making, but I wondered, would she actually welcome the fact that between the 23rd and the 30th November, there will be a cost of living payment of £324 uh, for people on tax credits? Is there anything she would welcome that the UK government are doing to help support people? Uh, Emma Roddick. I, I, I genuinely struggle to respond to, to a comment that it's, it's wrong to be negative about such a negative situation. We're here discussing the situation that my constituents find themselves in because of UK government policies. And it is very negative. It's a negative experience to go through. And yes, will I, will I welcome changes to, to the UK government's uh, decisions? Well, absolutely. But we can't rely on one month to the next what our overall budget will be because of these changes. And given we can't borrow, can't overspend, that's, that's a ridiculous state of affairs to be in. But as, as I was saying, um, I, I outline these things because I genuinely think a lot of people don't realise how many of the levers we don't have access to. And with the Tories down south becoming increasingly litigious around the Scottish Parliament taking decisions it sees as out with our remit, our limited powers are an important bit of context in this debate. We are beholden to a right-wing government that decides the high-level social security system design and, worse, our budget. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation has estimated 1.5 million people have been plunged into poverty since the Tories took office. That is outrageous, and it shows that the cost of living crisis we are tasked with tackling is conservative made. Constituents have asked me over the last year how a government could make such huge mistakes, and I'm scared that the answer is that they're not mistakes, because my experience of claiming universal credit and PIP suggests that sanctions and punishment for being poor is exactly what is intended by this system. 
Presiding officer, I'm proud of the work that's going on in the Cabinet Secretary's portfolio this term. The work on equalities, on preventing homelessness, increasing tenants' rights and tackling poverty is astounding before we even get to the monumental changes being brought through by Social Security Scotland on adult disability payment. They are a world away from what I'm used to dealing with through the DWP. If anything proves that we can do better here, it's that. The Tories can pretend that anyone in the SNP is hiding behind reserve powers, but anyone who thinks about it for 10 seconds or looks into it, however briefly, can tell that that is all it is. Pretense. Thank you very much, Ms. Roddick. I now call Morris Golden to be followed by Paul McLean again for around five minutes. Mr. Golden. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Perhaps a rose between two thorns in terms of the speaking lineup. Uh, I'd also like to thank the uh, committee and the clerks for their uh, report. Uh, before the pandemic, over 600,000 Scots were estimated to be over indebted. As the pandemic raged, Citizens Advice Scotland suggests that 60,000 either saw those debts get worse or were plunged into debt for the first time. And the problem is likely to get worse. Putin's invasion of Ukraine has seen energy prices skyrocket and households struggling with ballooning bills, especially the most vulnerable. And there and they are the ones most likely to face poverty and struggle with debt. The committee report points out that disabled people face higher costs. One in five individuals, along with one in four families with a disabled child, contend with extra costs of over £1,000 per month. I also want to raise the impact of digital inclusion. Yes, happy to. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the member for taking the intervention. What is the member's view on, on rumours that the UK government is considering means testing those essential benefits for disabled people? Morris Golden. Well, I don't comment on rumours, and that's a matter for the UK government, and I would hope that the member can raise that through the appropriate channels, which is about 500 miles south. Um, but I also wanted to raise the impact of digital exclusion. Representing rural communities... I know how difficult it can be for them to access online resources and, as the committee report highlights, those digitally excluded may take longer to seek help with money problems, a delay that can make these problems worse. And with so many dealing with debt, it's no surprise that advice services are under enormous pressure. The committee heard how they are, and I quote, stretched beyond breaking point. Deputy President Officer, the crisis facing families is bigger than any one political party, so we need Scotland's two governments to be working together to help those most in need. And I note the committee report recommends both the UK and the Scottish Government continue to look at ways to tackle inflation, rising energy prices and the cost of living crisis. Both governments have already taken action. Alongside the UK government, yes, happy to. Siobhan Brown. Thank you. I thank the member for taking the intervention. With policies such as the two-child cap, the benefit cap, five-week wait, and also the lower universal credit payments for parents under 25, can I ask the member what impact these policies are having on people facing challenges with debt? Morris Gordon. Well, the UK government's energy bill cap has helped. They announced a £37 billion package to help families with the cost of living crisis, and that needs to be focused on. Balanced against that, you've got the Scottish government failed to eradicate fuel poverty in 2016, as promised. SNP policy is to increase the, the customers' electricity bills through heightened transmission charges in order to subsidise predominantly big business. That's the reality, and that is the problem that the SNP and Green members have here in this Parliament. They're not willing to stand up for their constituents and take the Scottish Government, who's failing Scottish families, to task. But I do welcome the Scottish Government has committed £12.5 million to support debt income maximisation services. I hope the Scottish Government take note of the warnings in the report about the severe strain money services are under. 
and also the Committee's recommendation on specific funding for services supporting those suffering mental health issues. The Committee also recommends the Scottish Government and COSLA look at, into writing off school meal debt. My position, and that of my party, is that parents should not be in danger of running up school meals debt in the first place. So let us make school meals free for all children in primary and special schools. If a cost of living crisis is not the right time to do it, then when is? Going back to my earlier comments on digital exclusion, I note the Committee urges the SNP Government to support access to the internet through public spaces like libraries. This is not a luxury. Digital access is needed to apply for benefits and other government services. But it is increasingly hard for councils to support such services after years of underfunding by the SNP Government. Just yesterday, we saw the front page of the Courier warning a £51 million black hole in the Angus Council budget. Across Scotland, local authorities have little option but to cut services and raise council tax, a combination that only serves to pile more pressure on those already struggling. What we really need is a long-term solution to help those trapped on low incomes while preventing people falling into debt to make basic needs. That solution is ensuring full employment with high-quality, well-paid jobs. My party has already offered ideas on this, rapid retraining courses, especially in the digital sector, job security councils to provide meaningful opportunities. Deputy President Officer, the challenge myself and others are outlining here today are tough to tackle but not impossible. We need both governments to work together. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Golden. We have now exhausted most of the time we had in hand, so interventions probably will have to be accommodated within um, your speaking allocation. With that, I call uh, Paul McLennan to be followed by Martin uh, Whitfield for around five minutes. Mr McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer, and thanks for the opportunity to speak in this, uh, this debate this afternoon. As a member of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee, Taking evidence from many groups and individuals was a heartbreaking experience at, at times. The committee looked at the challenges related to low income and debt. In Scotland, this was to help the committee develop its priorities for work throughout the session, and I think we have already picked up some of these points uh, already and will develop these uh, during the session. Main issues uh, raised uh, were social stigma around about problem debt, due to digital exclusion and accessing support services, signposting to free debt advice, as we have heard, the links between problem debt and health, we heard from Gillian Martin. The high cost of childcare and issues with statutory debt solutions. The issue of low income and debt has, of course, worsened since we held the inquiry. Food inflation is now approximately 15 per cent, with some basics increasing by up to 25 per cent. UK inflation rate is the highest rate in the G7. Mortgage interest rates have rocketed. Two-year fixed rates are now over 6 per cent. Energy costs have, of course, massively increased, with the UK government backtracking on its support package. The UK already has the worst poverty and inequality levels in North West Europe. The impact of Brexit on the cost of living crisis can also not go unnoticed. Soaring prices and labour shortages are consequences of a decision that we in Scotland did not make. Only this morning, the Herald reported today that exports have dropped 13 per cent since Brexit. Last week, I offered the oil Labour MSPs the opportunity to stand up and advise me of any benefits of Brexit to Scotland. I will offer that opportunity to Tory MSPs today. There we go. Brexit is also making Brexit is making people in Scotland poorer. There is no doubt about that. Now we can all have political um, discussions and talk about where today, but I want to focus on some of the quotes from witnesses in our sessions. Peter Kelly from the Poverty Alliance said, "We need to remember that the cost of living crisis comes on top of budgets already being stretched for people on low incomes during the pandemic, which comes under from the fact that benefit levels were unfrozen only at the start of the pandemic." We need to remember the context in which we go into inquiry is one of the most significant that people are facing at this time. We must bear that in mind when we think about solutions. Miles Briggs talked about the impact of inflation in his speech. The UK government must increase benefit rates by inflation next year. That is not being guaranteed by the new Prime Minister. That has to be guaranteed and that has to be uh, taken forward. On the two-child limit in food banks, Kirsten McKechnie from the Child Poverty Action Group said all families have been affected now. However, evidence from the First World Trust shows that because more families have been affected by the two-child limit on benefits, an increasing number of families with young children are using food banks, which is impacting on early years of a child's life. Earlier on as well, we have seen some surveys saying that 
35 percent of people under 25 or young families may not be uh, sufficient enough to heat their homes this, this year. We think that there may be a direct correlation between food bank use and the two-tier limit, said Kirsty. On a universal credit on rent arrears, Betty Stone from Edinburgh Tenants Federation said the worst thing that, that was uh, ever done was the introduction of universal credit and handling the money to people in their hands. I have found that rent arrears have gone through the roof since universal credit was introduced. Officer, the support provided today uh, in Scotland is unique and unmatched across the UK. The Scottish child payment is unique to Scotland, the most ambitious child poverty reduction measure in the UK. From the 14th of November, the five, the five family payments, including the Scottish child payment, could be worth over £10,000 by the time a child reaches term six, and £9,700 for subsequent children. That is an incredible help from the Scottish Government. In March, the Scottish Government also upgraded eight other Scottish benefits by 6 per cent, which was around about double than the 3.1 C uh, CPI, which the UK Government increased benefits by at that time. In light of the Scottish Fiscal Commission forecast, the Scottish Government is set to invest £4.2 billion in benefits expenditure in 2022-23, providing support to over 1 million people, money which will go directly to people who need it most and support people to live independent lives. The Scottish Government's second benefit take-up strategy, published in October 2021, also set out how the Scottish Government is working to ensure people can access the support they are entitled to. Fiscal flexibility is essential in demand-led directorates such as Social Security. At the moment, the Scottish Government is dealing with an inflationary impact for reducing the Scottish budget by £1.7 billion. We have a fixed budget which, with extremely limited borrowing powers. We need a realistic fiscal framework renegotiated. The UK Government could allow realistic borrowing powers for the Scottish Government within the devolved set-up with agreed criteria at this stage, right now, at this particular stage just now. And yet, we have Scottish Labour who won't support this. We will have the ridiculous position of Labour who would vote against giving this Parliament more powers to deal with this issue. The Scottish Government is supporting most vulnerable and with the powers it has. It could do much more as an independent country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLennan. I now call Martin Whitfield to be followed by uh, Maggie Chapman for uh, around five minutes. I am very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, and it is a great pleasure to speak in this debate. And can I start by extending my thanks and compliments to the committee, and in particular the convener, um, for this excellent report that covers so much that affects every one of our constituents day in, day out. In the short time that I have, I would just like to concentrate on a short aspect, namely paragraphs 165 to 174, that deal with school meal debt. And I would like to start by thanking Abelor for their evidence, both to the committee, but also to thank the committee for the weight that they gave it to this important matter. I concentrate on this small part not because of the lack of importance that other matters raise in this report merit, but because it would be both a significant and, I suggest, simple step to alleviate the pressures both on our families but also the children, a significant number who are fully aware of the situation where they choose to eat at school and the problems that that causes the family. I welcome the conclusion at paragraph 172 with a recommendation the Scottish Government works with COSLA and local authorities to write off individual school meal debt that allow families a clean slate as they move into a new school year and indeed possibly into high school, a completely new school setting. This debt should not follow them. And I also echo the committee's call at paragraph 173 that they urge the Scottish Government to implement its free school meal expansion as soon as possible. This echoes, of course, Scottish Labour's call for the Scottish Government to stop passing the buck, provide funding for all local authorities to write off existing debt relating to the provision of school meals and deliver on their manifesto commitment to roll out free school meals to all ages in Scotland's primary schools. And this supports the convener's opening discussion in her speech, which I welcomed. I do this and call for this on the basis of the evidence that Abelor submitted to the committee and I believe it's right to put on the chamber record some of the facts that they found. The concern at the level of school meal debt in schools across Scotland that indicate many families with children not eligible for free school meals are struggling to afford to feed their children. The inconsistent approach across Scotland as to how individual local authorities respond to school meal debt and help and support families in such circumstances who may indeed be experiencing financial hardship. There are fewer families eligible for free school meals than 20 years ago as a result of the income thresholds for eligibility failing to keep pace with inflation. And there's a real concern of a hidden school hunger, particularly amongst our secondary school pupils who do not receive the free school meals so often trumpeted, and rightly so, for primary one to five, 
but not P6 to 7. Free school meal eligibility, free schools currently does not appear to benefit enough low-income families. The income thresholds for free school meal eligibility, along with other benefits for families, in receipt of child tax credits is currently £17,005, £7,920 for those in receipt of child tax credits and working tax credits. When these thresholds were first introduced back in 2002, the threshold was 13,230 and 5,060 respectively. Those income thresholds have changed very little over the last 20 years in monetary terms. They have failed to keep pace with inflation during that time. Therefore, it's clear, the eligibility for free school meals, particularly at secondary school, has not kept up with inflation. How often have we heard the call, rightly so, that the Scottish, the Scottish Government's budget should be increased because of the inflation. Well, here is an opportunity to show the Scottish Government believe what they say by increasing these eligibilities, at the very least by inflation, and open up free school, opportunity, free school meal opportunities for those young people in our high schools. So can I ask the Minister, will the Scottish Government raise the eligibility criteria for free school meals in line with the historic inflation to ensure that more low-income working families receive this entitlement and reduce the likelihood of school hunger in our secondary schools. And finally, I have returned to this in the Chamber on many times, I will continue to do so. Article 27 of the UNCRC provides for an adequate standard of living. It states that parties recognise the right of every child to a standard of living adequate for that child's physical, mental, spiritual, moral and social development. This includes the right to food. So when will this government bring back the UNCRC to this chamber so that our young people can both recognise the rights the Scottish Government and the Scottish people want to give them, but possibly more importantly, enforce those rights? Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Whitfield. I now call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Douglas Lomston for around five minutes. Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Britain and the United States are poor societies with some very rich people. These are not my words, but a headline from that well-known radical left-wing broadsheet, the Financial Times. That is the reality we are living in, communities where most people are, to a greater or lesser extent, struggling. struggling. Struggling to eat enough of what they need to stay healthy, struggling to stay warm, to give their children what they need to get through the school day to sleep without that terrible jolting thump to the heart as they wake and remember the looming bills. And for the poorest, it's even worse. Last year, the lowest earning 5% of households in Britain were 20% worse off than their counterparts, not only in, in Norway and Germany and Switzerland, but in Slovenia too. These households, these families, couples and single people, they aren't doing anything wrong. On the contrary, most are doing exactly what they've been told to do, Told will be their route out of poverty. Told will be their pathway to the sunny uplands of prosperity and peace of mind. They are working. But, as the committee's report so vivid vividly shows us, that work and the social security to which our citizens are rightly and fully entitled are just not enough to keep our neighbours, our constituents, our friends out of the chilling chasm of debt. This isn't debt incurred frivolously on luxuries the rich take for granted. It's food, it's rent, it's council tax and school meals. The committee makes wise and sensitive recommendations about changes to processes, attitudes, resources and regulation. But wider reforms are needed too. Reforms to both work and social security, to taxation and to the fundamental question, what is our economy for? We need decent pay for everyone, not just about manage if you take three jobs and never see your children pay, but pay that means families can thrive, can pay their bills and still have a little bit left over, can enjoy the short years of childhood instead of merely enduring them. That means a genuine living wage, and I'm proud that we are making good progress on that here in Scotland. We need decent conditions, work that brings security, respect, fulfilment, equal opportunities and an effective voice for workers. That's what the Fair Work Agenda means. And all work in Scotland, sooner rather than later, must become fair work. We need wealth redistribution. And yes, that means taxing the rich. That might make some of us nervous, but our constituents are way ahead of us. 
The Scottish Social Attitude Survey, published yesterday, showed 68 per cent of people agreeing that, and I quote, government should redistribute income from the better off to those who are less well off. More than half of that 68 per cent agreed strongly, and only 4 per cent strongly disagreed. The Westminster government, whichever iteration it's in today, likes to talk about having a mandate. That 68 per cent sounds like a very clear mandate to me. Because inequality is not just bad for the poor, it's bad for everyone. It's bad for individual health and well-being, for communities, for educational outcomes and economic success. During the fleeting fiasco of the Tory plan to scrap the 45% tax ban, even city traders were not dancing on their desks. They were warning how pointless it is to be privately rich and publicly poor. We need dig dignified, respectful, humane and sensitive social security, both in terms of its level of payments and of its processes. We've endured years of toxic rhetoric from Westminster and the media, deliberately inadequate, inadequate systems and consciously cruel implementation. That has literally cost lives. I'm thankful that we as Scottish Greens have successfully argued for the mitigation in Scotland of some of that bitter cruelty, the bedroom tax, the benefit cap, the obscenity of the rape clause. There is much more to do and I and I know others are determined to do it. One thing we really do need to progress faster is the implementation of a universal basic income, something Greens have long supported. Such a measure places dignity at the heart of our economy. One's worth should never be measured by one's ability to contribute only economically. Our worth as humans goes far beyond being cogs in the labour market machine. A universal basic income would also stop people getting penalised by the clawbacks of late or non-payments of debts. The Scottish Government's work on the minimum income guarantee is very welcome, and we need to go further as soon as we can. And finally, we, see we need opportunities for people to build better, to co-create a shared future, as well as securing their own livelihoods now. A truly just transition to a future economy is one which brings everyone along, with support for responsible small and larger businesses, with green jobs in the caring and creative, as well as renewable sectors, with employment that recognises that we are first and foremost human beings, not human resources. For that is what our economy is for, to sustain us as people and the earth we stand upon. If there are wealth creators, they are certainly not the billionaires. Those are the wealth creators we should support. Thank you, Ms Chapman. I now call Douglas Lumsden to be followed by Karen Adam for around five minutes, Mr Dump Lum. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thank you to the committee and clerks for producing this important report. This Parliament is rightly spending a great deal of time discussing the cost of living crisis and its impact on our most vulnerable communities, and I welcome today's focus on those with low incomes who are in danger of falling into debt. We have many great organisations in Scotland who are working on this matter, and I would like to uh, particularly mention the work of Christians Against Poverty and its service to help people who are struggling with debt. Emma Jackson, their CEO, in giving evidence to the committee, gave some concerning figures. A third of clients at Christians Against Poverty say that they regularly miss meals because they do not have enough income, while a quarter are reporting that they are skipping putting the heating on, and about 65 per cent of their clients say that they had to borrow from family or friends to afford food or fuel. And this situation is forecast to get worse over the winter. In last week's debate, I highlighted the work that the UK Government is doing to assist the most vulnerable in our communities with our heating costs, as well as measures to get more money into their pockets. And I ran out of time uh, last week, President Officer, so I won't go over them all again as I attempt to finish on time today, you'll be glad to hear. And the Committee makes many observations about action from the Scottish Government that has been promised, but as yet, unfulfilled. The Committee welcomes the Government's commitment to undertake a full independent review of the Scottish Welfare Fund and asks for that to be concluded and published as soon as possible. And I understand that the review is now underway, and I would ask the Minister to clarify the timetable of that review to the Parliament today when he sums up, and when can we expect to see its report, its recommendations, and will they be enacted in time to help those with the crisis over the winter? And the committee has called for that to be completed bef before the end of the year. And uh, I would like to hear if the minister can confirm that this will indeed be published this year. 
The Committee has also called for COSLA and the Scottish Government to work together to develop national standards for council tax collection. In her evidence to the Committee, Emma Jackson again made this important point. But in their response to the Committee, the Scottish Government have once again passed the buck, suggesting that they are not minded to legislate, and this is a local government issue. The whole purpose of a national standard is that it is developed and agreed nationally so that someone in Defries and Galloway has the same experience of council tax arrears as someone in Aberdeenshire. It is not rocket science, and it is long overdue. The Committee also recommends that the Government move ahead with its free school meal expansion as soon as possible. The Government's response says that they are committed to do so within the parliamentary term. But again, there is no timetable and empty promises from the SNP Green devolved Government. President officer, I would like now to turn to the issue of early intervention and prevention. Councils are on the front line of our social care provisions and are best placed for early intervention. But the real term cut of £700 million since 2014 has meant that their ability to provide services have been affected. Advisors and helpline staff who assist people in dealing with debt are cut to the bone, with phone lines often jammed and people unable to get through to someone who can help. Audit Scotland have urged the Scottish Government to develop a long-term planning approach to address child poverty and warned that their policies are focused on lifting children out of poverty rather than preventing it in the first place, which surely should be the most single, single most important focus for any government. Yes, it will. Eleanor Whitton. Thank you, Member, for taking an intervention. I just wonder if you would agree with me that the best and you know, Ms. most Whitton, I don't think your microphone's on. Is your card in? Sorry. It's down there. The best and quickest, swiftest early intervention in this regard would be to provide uh, a welfare state um, that actually addresses poverty at source, as opposed to having to mitigate it. Mr. Lumsden, I, I think the member is missing the point completely. What we, what do you completely are? What we, what we want to have is a society where people aren't relying on welfare, but have the jobs, the, the, the opportunities to, to progress. The best way to tackle poverty is by providing good education, getting people into well-paid employment and growing our economy. We want to see this Scottish Government commit to developing schemes that provide employment for our young people. We want them to tackle the root cause of poverty and we want them to focus on growing our economy to provide the opportunity our people deserve. Presiding officer, in closing, I want again to thank all those organisations who gave such moving evidence to the committee about the people that they work with and the stories that they told. We are facing a very difficult time with many households fearful of the future and how they are going to meet their bills and financial commitments. This government should be doing all it can to address those needs, but instead we get empty promises and diversion politics, blaming someone else while saying there is nothing they can do. We believe that there is much, much more that the Scottish Government can do, including deliver on some of their promises of the past. We want to see a fair funding settlement for local authorities so they can deliver the help and services required in our communities. We want to see the free school meals delivered, not promised. Debt services funded properly, economic growth and employment at the heart of government policy, and an you increased focus now, from Mr. the government Lundin. on their day job. The people of Scotland deserve a government that thinks about their needs rather than stoking division and grievance. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Lumsden. I now call Karen Adam to be followed by Michael Mara for around five minutes. Ms. Adam. Thank you, President Officer. And I thank their committee for the work. There are no words that adequately portray the frustration many of us feel at the moment. And many of us have been doing all we can to try and mitigate against the unfolding catastrophe. The Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation identified that in one of the local authorities in my constituency of Aberdeenshire, nine data zones within the 20 per cent most deprived in Scotland. All nine of these zones can be found in Frisborough and Peterhead, which are both in the constituency of Bampshire and Buck and Coast that I represent. This year I held cost of living events and surgeries throughout the constituency to help people manage through this crisis, inviting Social Security Scotland, local authorities, Citizens, Citizens Advice Scotland and food banks to work alongside me to provide urgent support. And these, these people came along to help in utter crisis caused by the UK government's policies. Under the Tory UK government, inflation has run out of control 
mortgage rates are at their highest since the great financial crash, and energy costs have doubled. That is the Tory legacy of government for 12 years. Yes. Douglas Lomston. Uh, I thank the member for uh, taking the intervention. She mentioned fuel costs. Well, she not agree with me that the, the biggest um, factor in that fuel cost rising is actually the, the war in Ukraine. Karen Adam. I thank the member for his intervention. And I would say to him that it's the responsibility of the government to provide stability to its citizens, regardless of where that instability comes from, just like the Scottish Government provides stability while the UK Government is in unstable. Okay. As the cash squeeze continues, poverty worsens and financial struggle deepens. We know that, we know that those with the least amount of money are made to pay the highest cost to live. Low-income families can't afford to bulk buy and create long-term savings on goods, but instead are having to borrow high-interest loans to pay for basic food items, and that's if they can even get access to credit. They don't have the fallback of savings to dip into on a rainy day, because every day is a rainy day. The judgment and lack of basic understanding from the UK government, who should know better, is shocking. To the extent that supermarket chains such as Morrison's, are offering free hot food, such as potatoes and beans, for those struggling, if they use the code words and ask for Henry. 315 years of the Union, 43 years of neoliberal orthodoxy, and folk in Peterhead and Fraserburgh have to use code words at a supermarket chain to get a big tatty with beans because they can't afford food. The charitable impulse is decent, but my goodness, the necessity for it is absolutely repugnant. No, you've said enough. There's no doubt that the cost of remaining in the UK has pushed people into poverty, destitution and hunger, and that Scotland needs the opportunity to break free. The differences between the devolved Scottish Government and reserved UK Government are stark, and they seek to destroy the well-being of our nation. We seek to build an economy based on the well-being of our citizens at its very core. Even under the limitations of devolution, the ambition and compassion of the Scottish Government have seen us introduce many mitigations mentioned by some of my colleagues this afternoon. These are the measurements of a government that values the well-being of its population. Many of the witnesses that the committee heard from welcomed so many of these actions from the Scottish Government, and this has also been evidenced recently by the Scottish Attitude Survey which 74% of adults reported that they trusted the Scottish Government to run Scotland's affairs. Presiding officer, what I have detailed are some of the statistics and steps taken to combat the damage being done, but behind each and every one is a story of personal tragedy for individuals, families and children. A concluding remark of a welfare officer who advises and supports people suffering from the unlevel playing field were, people talk about the ability to heat or eat. It's not an option anymore. We are facing people that will suffer mentally and physically because they can no longer do either of those. We do have the option of a better future though. Scotland is a nation rich with energy, world renowned food and agriculture sector and sustainable fishing industry. And we will do so much better with the powers that come with independence. Thank you, Ms. Adam. I now call Michael Mara to be followed by Mary McNair for again for around five minutes. Mr. Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by thanking colleagues in the Social Justice and Social Security Committee for the work undertaken in producing this report? Uh, the debate clearly could not be more timely, reflecting on all the contributions we have heard so far. People across uh, my home city of Dundee and the whole of the North East are fearing the winter and the huge debts they know they will end up carrying. The cumulative evidence of this inquiry shows what an extraordinary weight that is on the backs of those who can least endure it. With interest rates rising uh, even faster than expected due to the disaster of the Tory economic dogma of recent weeks and the grotesque incompetence they have shown, debt will have an even greater impact on families. The cost of living crisis means that these impacts will be even more broadly felt across the income brackets. And debt, as we know, is so often the trigger for crises in families. Uh, we, we must do all we can to lift the burden and that mental weight that comes with it, and also the impossible choices that ensue. The picture of Scottish poverty is a stark one, an economy that does not work. 
for so many ordinary Scots. Two in three single parents in Scotland with little or no savings to fall back on. Four in five parents with a baby report an impact on their mental health because they are worried about money. And nearly one in five households on low incomes in Scotland have gone hungry and cold this year, and that is before we enter these winter months. So with mortgage rates continuing to rise for thousands of people across our country day after day due to that Tory mismanagement, it is clear from the report's contents that many more will continue to struggle as the financial pressure of the cost of living crisis increases. And the Social Justice and Social Security Committee's report provides ideas to help reverse this increase in poverty. And that is why Scottish Labour supports the conclusions and the recommendations of the paper. And with more people struggling to get by, these questions must be answered, not just in this report, but every day by both the UK and Scottish Government Ministers. What more can you do to help? What more are you going to do to address the fuel poverty that so many people are experiencing? The answer, Presiding Officer, is not another policy review or another consultation. We have got plenty of those. It is immediate action now. Immediate action like, as the committee reported, the Scottish Government making full use of its devolved powers to the fullest possible extent. And as we enter an incredibly hard winter, we do need practical solutions for low income and debt that will help struggling families now. And Scottish Labour has presented a plan that, if implemented now, would make a positive difference immediately to people's lives. Our cost of living plan would wipe out school meal debt, provide funding for debt advice services and relieve people of some of their debt burdens. These are real and practicable measures that this government could take. And we know that the actions in our plan, such as wiping out the school meal debt, will benefit up to 11,000 families. But Scottish Labour isn't just suggesting these things, we're actually doing them. In Labour minority controlled East Renfrewshire, they've introduced a £4.4 million package to help tackle the cost of living crisis, including direct support for the most vulnerable this winter, support for those in communities facing isolation and loneliness, support for the Citizens Advice Bureau, allowing increased provision of money, advice and benefits assistance for residents. All of these things that Pam Duncan Glancy and Martin Whitfield have set out already today have been put into action by Labour councillors. And that's just one council doing whatever they can to help. And I know that councils across Scotland are eager to do more. If they weren't staring down the barrel of devastating cuts, they would and could do more to help people who are struggling. And this government could provide funds for money advice centres that can allow them to plan for the long term rather than the short term. This precarious nature of one-year bits of grant funding here and there is incredibly difficult for the organisation. And there's been no extra funding to help with the demand arising from the cost of living crisis as there was during the pandemic. And that limits the ability to increase capacity and help the greater numbers we all know and we all hear daily are seeking support and advice from their citizens advice service. And at a time when more people than ever are turning to these types of organisation, it's essential, absolutely essential, that we fund them properly. So I do urge the Scottish Government to move quickly and to take up the recommendations from this report. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Mara. And I now call the last speaker in the open debate, uh, Mary McNair. Uh, up to uh, five minutes, please, Ms McNair. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate on behalf of my constituents. It is an important debate at a time when many are struggling to cope with this cost of living emergency. The Westminster crashing of the economy has made a difficult and challenging time for many so much worse. With inflation out of control, mortgages spiralling and the cost of fuel making people choose between heating and eating, I am worried about the emerging situation of people having to borrow to pay for essentials. This is not borrowing to invest in the value of their properties or to buy, for example, a car to allow them to take up employment. No, this is borrowing to, to actually eat, to heat, to clothe and to pay rent. Inside Housing recently reported that more than half of social uh, housing residents have used credit to cover essential household costs. This is a, a vicious circle for many and simply unsustainable. The Scottish Government are doing much within the powers and budgets of this Parliament. The Scottish Child Payment set at five times the amount other political parties were calling for. The Council Tax Reduction Scheme, more generous than other parts of the UK. The mitigation of the bedroom tax, the benefit cap, the rent freeze, and a moratorium on evictions, the £20 million fuel and security fund, 
and millions more in discretionary housing payments to help families sustain their tenancies. And at the heart of uh, that, a new so social security system that is fun founded on uh, dignity, fairness and respect. Contrast this with a Westminster system from governments of all political colours that enshrined and promoted stigma. The private sector, medical assessments that cause so much misery and pain. The sanction regime used to horribly deny already inadequate subsistence levels. And on the issue of debt, presiding officer, a system devised to ensure claimants need to get in into debt to avoid going without. The five-week wait in universal credit does just that. It forces people to take an advance and pay it back, meaning less in the future months. CPAG's uh, evidence to the committee on the real impact of this is heartbreaking. It fully captures a Westminster benefit system that is frankly setting people up to fail. They cite the case of a young homeless woman. The DWP are deducting £63.30 a month to recover an advance payment. And there are also two other deductions of £8.95 and £8.96. And this leaves her with just £56 and two pence a week to live on. This is senseless. I am therefore not surprised to read the report from the Glasgow University and the Centre for Population Health that concludes that 20,000 excess deaths in Scotland are likely to be caused by Westminster-imposed austerity. And yet we are still pleading with Westminster to uprate benefits in line with inflation. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation has pointed out that food prices have, have risen faster than at any uh, point over the last three decades. They also assert that only uprating benefits by earnings will leave this UK government responsible for the biggest permanent real life terms cut to the basic rate of benefit in a single year. Westminster, at the very least, uh, should uprate benefits by inflation and get the support needed to those in greatest need. Finally, President Officer, the burden of debt will take a hit very soon with the onset of Christmas. And I know many of my constituents are approaching it with dread. There is so much demand on family budgets at this time, and I welcome the doubling bridging payment by the Scottish Government that will give some assistance. It is appalling, however, that the Westminster Christmas bonus is still set at £10. And in 1972, the Tories introduced this payment, and it is not astonishing that it is still set at £10 today. They failed to uprate it in Government, and the Liberals and Labour did not rush to remedy this either. And it is estimated that the Christmas bonus would be well um, worth in excess of £100 if it kept pace with inflation. During this cost of living emergency, I call on the Tories, Labour, the Libs to join with me to demand it is uprated by inflation and recalculated to the value necessary to compensate for the last 50 years. I conclude with my usual mention and tribute to many food banks, support groups, advice agencies, housing associations and council services in my constituency. I am on their side and I thank them for everything they do. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Ms McNair. We will now move to closing speeches and I call on Foisal Chowdhury to wind up on behalf of Scottish Labour up to six minutes, please, Mr Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I would like to thank my fellow members and clerks of the committee uh, for their work in producing this report. I think it is a report that we can all be proud of, even if the situation it describes falls far short of the ideal. As a member of the committee, I would also like to thank the many organizations who gave evidences to us for their uh, invaluable contribution. I agree with my colleague Pam Duncan Glancy that it was an eye-opening experience. The convener of the committee highlighted uh, the section in the report relating to school meals debt, and my colleague Martin Whitfield noted how little the thresholds for free school meals have changed in the past 20 years. I would certainly hope that the Scottish Government would look at the aspect of this under its control and part of any efforts to co uh, combat child poverty. I must agree with uh, Paul McLennan that it is 
incredibly important for that matters discussed in this report that the UK government ensured that benefits are operated with inflation. And Maggie Chapman rightly noted the problem uh, fundamental to these issues of low pay and in work poverty and the needs to address these. I'm also grateful to Gillian Martin for highlighting the lack of data regarding poverty in ethnic minorities, a problem we are all too often faced with in this place. My colleague Michael Mara noted the value of Scottish Labour's cost of living plan and where Scottish Labour Council have been doing great work to take real action on the cost of living. If I may draw out what I see as a common theme that came up again and again in the committee hearing the represented in this report. This is the theme of false economy. We have systems in place to try to mitigate the effects of poverty, to try to ease people out of debt. But we can, we can see where the failure to provide and promote early intervention can lead into even more costly interventions later. Douglas Lumsden noted this. An example of this with eviction. The committee here that there is no moral or business cases for threatening a tenant in areas with eviction. The committee was told that the cost of eviction a single male with a low support needs is in the region of 24,000 per eviction. We therefore begin to see a picture where every eviction is a failure. The failure of the system that should have been there to help and did not. The failure, in short, of the social safety net. And this failure costs us even more in the long run. Miles Briggs expressed his uh, hopes that UK government policy on welfare could be looked at where the committee has heard that it perpetrates uh, this effect with young parents, and I welcome that. We see similar problems in the approach of debt, missed opportunities, which cost everywhere later. We cannot afford monetarily or morally to apply this uh, case cutting false economics across our society. We clearly need intervention where they are most effective for people's lives, and often uh, this end up being more cost-effective for the state as well. So I would urge the Scottish Government to, to think very carefully about its policy response to this report. We must be vigilant against a penny-pinching approach in these early interventions. Pam Duncan Glancy has already highlighted the impact of funding cuts for the third sector organization on the front lines of this crisis. The nature of this false economy means that trying to save money from early intervention service can mean catastrophic cost further down the line. And these costs are greater cost to both government and to the real people's lives behind the figure and case studies we have now all heard about. I hope the Scottish Government takes a note of uh, not only the scale of the challenges ahead, which the committee has highlighted, but also the strategic thinking that will be required to deal with them. Thank you, Setting Officer. Thank you, Mr. Chaudhry. I now call on Jeremy Balfour to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr. Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. I would like to uh, begin, as other colleagues have, by thanking all those who aided in the production of this report, the convener, my fellow members of the committee, the clerks, and, of course, everyone who came and gave evidence to us. There's been a lot of work that's gone into this report. And I hope that it generally comes out a meaningful policy change 
for the better of those in Scotland who are struggling. Uh, I think the convener laid it out very helpfully when she said we need uh, Westminster, Scottish Government and local government here in Scotland to work together. And if I can say gently to those uh, from the SNP speeches, I think that has missed the point of today. Yeah. To simply spend every minute of your speech criticising one of those three and not critiquing what is happening within local government and within Scottish government then shows the weakness of the argument. Have Westminster got everything right? No, they haven't. But either Scottish government or local authorities. And if we need to move beyond this everything bad at Westminster, everything good by Scotland, and we need these three groups working together in partnership for the sake of the people of Scotland. Yeah. I want to thank all those, particularly the third sector organisations, who have sent briefings for this debate. Presiding officer, the report makes clear that there is a real and pressing issue in this country with debt. With over 600,000 people in Scotland struggling of debt of various size, it's evident that this problem simply is not going to go away. There are key measures that can be taken in Scotland to move us towards that, to help with us towards that. There's been a number of great contributions that have been made today, but I want to focus on a couple of reflections that I believe that are key to solving this crisis. Firstly, um, there is a need to be person-centred, to take debt and low-income issues not as one big issue, but to break it down into individual issues. We have to acknowledge that each case is different and doesn't fit in exactly into a cookie-cutter mode. We need to look holistically across many council departments to ensure income maximisation, that people are getting all the help that is available and that they're entitled to. Given that benefits are currently being provided both by DWP and Social Security Scotland, it can often be difficult for claimants to be certain that they are getting all the support that is available to them. Any Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. Jeremy Balfour will be aware that obviously one of the duties on ministers uh, in uh, Scotland is that they have to promote uh, benefit uh, entitlement. Does he agree with me that actually it would be very helpful if you, the UK government were to take up the, the same position and actively promote uh, the reserve benefits that are uh, available to people to try and boost um, awareness of entitlement? Jeremy Balfour, I'll be able to give you your time back. Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, where I agree with the Cabinet Secretary is that we do need to promote all these benefits. Actually, I have to say, when I have visited um, job centres within my region here in Lothian, and when I've had conversations with DWP, I, I actually do see quite a proactive approach. Clearly, more can be done by both governments. And, and I do think, and I, and I welcome what the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister uh, for Social Security says, is that um, at the official level, there is a good working relationship. And I think we have to recognise that and build on that. Because any stress or toil on people's mental health is good to eliminate. Presiding officer, mental health is an issue that is closely wrapped up with debt, both as a cause and a symptom. As the report makes note of 2.5 million adults in the UK with mental health problems considering or attempting to take their own life while being behind on payments during the pandemic. 2.5 million. That number is tragic and throws into sharp relief the burden that can debt bring for so many. People are struggling in this way can have a debt and mental health form completed by a GP that can get better support and could help write off debt. In Scotland, GPs can charge around £25 for this form, but for the rest of the UK, they are banned from charging anything at all. I would join calls from others for Scottish Government to mimic this ban to ensure that all barriers to access are removed from those that need vital support. It's a small step, but a step that can be taken that would have a large effect especially in conjunction with wider mental health measures mentioned, as we've heard from others today. 
More must be done with campaigns and signposting, as the Cabinet Secretary said, both from this Government and from Westminster and local authorities. Let's have a look at what's happening on the ground. Lone parents, women, disabled people. What does the report say? It says this. 14.2% of people in Scotland were identified as being in problem debt, but only 20.5% of this group sought advice from free debt advice provider. Deputy President Officer, we need to work harder on this. Um, I have raised this point, um, as have other members uh, in this debate and in other debates with the Cabinet Secretary, in regard to will she commit to meet with the third sector to talk about third sector funding for three years. That commitment still hasn't been given by this government, and I find that disappointing. Deputy President Officer, we took evidence from those who are offering debt advice who are worried about their own job going forward next year, who are struggling with debt themselves. This seems to be in a strange position. To close, Deputy President Officer, I have given a couple of steps that could be taken by Scottish Government to help the burden of debt that many are struggling with. There is a danger that we go from this chamber this afternoon, having had a debate, made our political points, and pat, pat ourselves on the back. But that won't help my constituents. That won't help the people of Scotland who are struggling with debt. What we need is to lay aside some of our ideology and say practically, how can all of us, Westminster, Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government, local authorities, help to make things easier? We need cross-party conversation, we need cross-party working, and maybe less political ideology when we speak. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank you, Mr Balfour. I now call on Tom Arthur, Minister, to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Government. Up to eight minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I, I begin by thanking colleagues from across the Chamber for their contributions and what I thought was overall a, a very thoughtful and considered debate as merits such a substantive and, and, and well-written report as, been, as, uh, as has been produced. Uh, before turning uh, specifically to uh, the report, I do want to take the opportunity to respond to some issues that members have raised in the Chamber. Um, turning first, uh, Pam Duncan Glancy had uh, raised the issue of uh, mental health and moratorium. Uh, we did obviously provide a response with that in the uh, uh, response to the committee. Uh, perhaps I misheard uh, uh, what the member said, but I just want to clarify this is something that we have consulted on and we are considering seriously. I would also draw the member's attention to a programme for government commitment to a, a bankruptcy and diligence bill um, in this session. So I hope that does provide some reassurance. Um, Michael Mara raised a beg your pardon, uh, Martin Whitfield, I will turn to in, in the first instance, um, raised um, two issues with regards to um, free school meal debt, uh, UNCRC. I think he also um, raised the issue around eligibility. Um, on the latter point, happy to reflect, I would recognise that local governments do have a discretion around elig eligibility. We have engaged with partners on the issue of uh, debt. Um, I would just note that we do operate within extremely straitened fiscal circumstances. And with regards to UNCRC, that is something we are engaging with the UK Government on. Um, timetable will obviously be dependent upon that process and indeed what decisions Parliament wishes to take um, when and if our legislation is uh, reintroduced. Yeah, I'm happy to. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. With regard to the um, actual eligibility criteria, it does rest with the Scottish Government to increase um, the earnings amount that would bring those families, and particularly those children, um, in, secondary, in secondary school within the remit of free school meals, which would make a substantial difference at this time. Um, would the Minister undertake to look perhaps again at that and maybe push other uh, interested bodies to try and achieve that? Minister, I can give you your time back. Thank you very much, President Officer. Well, well, that specific portfolio responsibility does not sit with me. I am happy to consider it, but I would just stress as Public Finance Minister the extremely uh, challenging uh, fiscal environment in which we operate. But I recognise the sincerity of the points that the member raises. Um, Maggie Chapman um, made a very thoughtful contribution, and I, and I think she got to the heart of this. We obviously want to uh, move to a situation where, rather than having to react and redistribute, we do have an economy that pre-distributes and works for all. And of course, that is a medium to long-term aspiration. 
uh, but it does not, of course, detract from the need to take action in the here and now to support people at this most pressing of times. Um, Douglas Lumsden um, asked with regards to the Welfare Fund review. Uh, my colleague, the Minister for Social Security and Local Government, will be updating the committee soon on that particular matter. And finally, Michael Mara had raised the issue of support for advice services. We're providing £12.5 million um, in support for advice services. Um, I'm sure the member will correct me if I misheard him, but I believe he said that we had not provided additional support. We have. We're providing an additional £1.2 million pounds to enable expansion of energy advice services. Turning to just one general point that's been raised by a number of members, which is regards to three-year funding and funding for local authority resources, I am not going to um, rehearse all of the arguments we will no doubt have over the coming months as we move into the budget process, but the, uh, the reality is that we find ourselves in a position as the SFC have indicated that we have a, a real terms cut to our budget, and that has, of course, necessitated difficult choices, which have been compounded by the reality that we have had an erosion of our budget in the year of £1.7 billion. Notwithstanding that, there is a real terms increase in the total funding available for local authorities. We set out our aspirations around longer term funding through the RSR. But as members will appreciate, the biggest determinant of funding available to this Parliament is still decisions taken at Westminster by the UK Government. And given, if I can put it politely, the volatility we are seeing at Westminster and the uncertainty, that creates uh, problems for us in having long-term funding, which cascades down. Yes, I will give way to the member. Uh, 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 Jeremy Pelf. I am grateful to the Minister for giving way. I, I mean, he would recognise that uh, civil servants, teachers, doctors are guaranteed funding for three years. So why is the third sector different from that? Minister. I think the member makes um, an important point. We obviously have within government their legal commitment for things that we have to fund. But the reality is, to provide certainty, um, for the Scottish Government to be able to provide more certainty, we require more certainty. And as members will be aware, as I don't want to labour this point, but we are very much dependent under the fiscal framework upon decisions on public spending taken by the UK Government. And as the member will appreciate, we are in a period of extreme uncertainty, um, and we will not have more clarity until the 17th of November. And while we await to see what comes out of that, the mood music just now is that there is going to be a significant change, that this is going to potentially be um, a return to austerity. So it's, that creates a, an almost impossible situation for us. I could give you numbers, but these numbers could become completely meaningless the other side of the 17th of November. Now, presiding officer, I do want to turn to the, the committee's inquiry because its report brought into stark focus the price many Scots are paying uh, for living um, under a UK government that has overseen growth and inequality and poverty that long predates the uh, current cost crisis. And as we have now been hearing, Brexit has made and is, and is making and will continue to make all of us poorer. And the economic chaos visited upon us by the mini-budget will be felt by families and individuals for many years to come, exacerbating the challenge and circumstances that we were already facing. Everyone is hearing of friends and relatives now facing eye-watering increases in their mortgage payments. Inflation in everyday goods like food is at record levels and shows little sign of abating. And while the rise in energy costs is a global phenomenon, the Westminster Government is doing less than others, including ending the energy price guarantee in April something that appears to be a direct consequence of the reckless decision taken, decisions taken at the mini-budget. And as a consequence, more Scots are at risk of robbing Peter to pay Paul. But this is not the approach that this SNP-led government has taken. Our commitment to fair work seeks to give people an effective voice, opportunity, security, fulfilment and respect. And it is also about ensuring that work pays and offering a route out of poverty that is sustainable. That is one reason why we are providing an additional £140 million every year to local government to help them reach a pay settlement for their employees, which provides more support for those on the lowest incomes. As a good example of this government doing, as the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice made clear in our opening remarks, all that we can with the powers that we have to tackle poverty, protect people from financial harm and mitigate the effects of, well, Tories being Tories at Westminster. <laughs> I apologise, I am really <laughs> pressed for time now, having responded to the interventions. Um, our response to the committee's report was published in September. 
setting out the significant range of actions being taken by national and local government and partner organisations to improve the lives of everyone on low incomes and facing problem debt. Some of these have been mentioned today, including £3 billion allocated this year to mitigate increasing costs in households, one billion of which is only available in Scotland. A package of family benefits which is more generous than in England and in Wales, including the Scottish Child Payment, which later in November will have increased by 150 per cent in less than eight months. The unique baby box now in its fifth year, with nearly a quarter of a million delivered across Scotland, an additional £150 million provided to children in receipt of free school meals last year, and this through bridging payments, with the December payment being doubled to £260, £88 million in discretionary housing payments to support households with housing costs, protections against increasing rents and eviction action through the Tenant Protection Bill, £12.5 million invested this year in advice services and a further £2.3 million for the Early Resolution and Advice Programme. And we also have an important story to tell on Council Tax Reduction. The Council Tax Reduction Scheme is effectively Scotland's oldest protection measure and has been in place since 2013. Currently, 450,000 households benefit from this, on average resulting in savings of £750 per year for recipients. However, as the committee sets out, there is more that could be done to make people aware of their entitlement, supporting those experiencing difficulty in paying council tax and creating greater consistency in collecting council tax. So I undertake to fully explore with COSLA how we might take forward the committee's recommendations in this regard. Scotland has also developed a set of far-sighted protections and statutory debt solutions for people facing issues of problem debt, with debt advice at the heart of these mechanisms. We identified and responded quickly to the cost crisis, as we did during the pandemic, and have already introduced a number of protections for people who are most financially vulnerable. We have reduced bankruptcy application fees and removed all fees for those on certain benefits. Introduced in response to the pandemic, but now made permanent. We have increased the moratorium period, giving individuals six months breathing space to seek advice, free from creditor pressure. This is also now permanent. We have increased the level of debt required for a creditor to pursue bankruptcy for the courts, now fixed at £5,000 as compared with £3,000 prior to the pandemic. And from today, the protected minimum balance that can be retained when a bank arrestment is executed rises to £1,000, promoting greater financial resilience. The committee rightly highlighted the strong links between problem debt and mental health. And as I said to uh, Ms Duncan Clancy, I can assure members that we are working across government to design and implement bespoke protections for people experiencing financial and mental health crises. Presiding officer, the hugely successful debt, a debt arrangement scheme, or DAS, remains the UK's only statutory debt repayment scheme. Uh, recent improvements have, been increased, uh, have seen increased participation, bringing important protections for those taking control of their debt, and I can confirm that more action is planned on flexibility. But I recognise it can be challenging for people paying towards their debt through DAS, and the current economic chaos will be amplifying those challenges. The committee has made a number of recommendations relating to fees and debt ceilings, and I will consider all of these carefully, not least at a stakeholder roundtable later this week. But I can announce that I plan to bring forward additional protections to help people manage and paying their debt later this year. And I also look forward to discussing these issues at my stakeholder roundtable meeting later this week. In concluding, President Officer, I want to thank the committee members and everyone who gave evidence for the input to and extensive work on this inquiry. Most importantly, we should all be grateful to everyone who shared their, at times, harrowing experiences of debt and financial insecurity. I do not underestimate how traumatic reliving those experiences will have been for some, but I hope that they know that we hear, hear them, they have been listened to, and where we can do more, we will do so. And I also thank colleagues for their contributions to this debate. It has provided us all with a sombre opportunity to reflect on the pressures faced by households across Scotland. But it doesn't have to be this way, presiding officer. Scotland is a wealthy country, with a government that works hard to do the right of our people. We have lower taxes, including Minister, on council tax and conclude. water charges. Presiding officer, there is much more that we can do. I recognise, growing up in the area that I did in Scotland, the difference that having a Scottish Parliament has made compared to what the situation was for, my, for people who grew up in my Minister, area 40 years ago. Thank you. With independence, presiding thank you, officer, Minister. we can do so much more. Thank you. Okay. And I now call on Natalie Don to wind up the debate on behalf of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. Up to seven minutes, please, Ms Don. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. 
The striking evidence taken during the Committee's inquiry and the contributions which have been shared in this afternoon's debate have been very powerful. I am pleased that we have had the opportunity today to reflect on both the Social Justice and Social Security Committee's important report and the wider context of the cost crisis, which is causing significant hardship across Scotland. We have heard substantial accounts from colleagues in the committee, which have served to highlight the stark and at times really difficult accounts that we heard from our experts by experience, witnesses and third sector organisations. I am grateful for the contributions from all members today across the Chamber and from the Government. I am also grateful to the clerks for all their work associated with this inquiry. As we have heard this afternoon, our inquiry highlighted a number of specific challenges faced by people who are struggling with both low income and debt. Member speeches have covered a lot of areas, such as the wide scope of this inquiry, and I will try to capture some of these points in my closing comments. As the convener stated earlier, the evidence that we received around public sector debt and council tax debt was striking. There are examples of councils working with people in a holistic way and working with each other across local authority departments to join the dots of debt owed for housing or council tax or school meals and put individual support in place. But this is not true across all authorities. Some councils are taking proactive steps to write off specific debts and work on debt management with clients. However, there is a feeling that others are making up for lost time during the pandemic and pursuing debt in a very proactive and at times aggressive way. We know that people can be scared to answer their telephones or to answer a knock on the door. And we know that can cause worry, anxiety and a deterioration in mental health. A consistent and compassionate approach is needed across all council areas. A number of today's contributions have focused on free school meals, and rightly so. Our inquiry shows that with the current accrual of school meal debt, families are struggling to feed their children now. We welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to expand free school meals to all primary school children, but urge the Scottish Government to implement its free school meal expansion as soon as possible and encourage local authorities to finalise the works to allow the expansion to be delivered. By combining the individual write-off of existing school meal debt and preventing future accrual of debt in this area, we can eliminate this public debt which only burdens low-income families. Moving on, I want to highlight evidence received on the relationship between debt and mental health. Mental ill health can be both a cause and a symptom of debt problems, creating a vicious cycle which can be extremely difficult to break. There are many challenges in providing money advice to people with mental ill health, but it should also be an important consideration in service delivery. The majority of our experts by experience noted the impact of debt on their mental health through things like anxiety and depression, and they felt that mental health impacted on their ability to deal with their debt situation. As the Minister alluded to in his closing remarks, people with debt problems in Scotland have the opportunity to enter a moratorium on diligence, which stops creditors being able to take debt enforcement action against them. The committee called for this to be adapted to provide better help for people in mental health crises. We hope that practical proposals will be brought forward as a result of the Scottish Government's consultation on debt solutions and diligence. Looking also at physical health, the committee took evidence that people living with disabilities face higher living costs and are more likely to live in pov poverty. Contributions by the Convener of Health and Social Care Committee, Gillian Martin, echoed this, and some of the stories she shared were sobering, highlighting the extent and outcomes of increased spending that those with poor physical health and disabilities are currently experiencing. No one should be falling into debt to keep either them or their family members alive. For some people with low incomes, bankruptcy may be the only way to get a clean slate. We looked at the statutory debt solutions available to people with low incomes to see if any changes should be made to this legislative framework. Here, we made recommendations around application fees for bankruptcy and minimum debt thresholds. And I note the opportunity for quick action through the Scottish Government's consultation on debt solutions and diligence. Digital exclusion is another area which has been picked up on by numerous members today, and it is something that was highlighted regularly within the committee evidence sessions. We heard that this is holding people back from accessing debt advice, applying for jobs and benefits. The committee has asked the Scottish Government what measures it has taken to support access to free internet services and devices in public spaces. 
We have also asked the Scottish Government to work with the UK Government and stakeholders to consider if a model similar to that used during the pandemic could be developed to allow free access to trusted money advice websites. We welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to enhance funding for Connecting Scotland, which can provide free internet access for up to two years for those most in need for the remainder of this parliamentary session, but overall urge the, the Government to consider how it can support low-income households to continue to access an, uh, sorry, an internet connection in the longer term because it is absolutely vital that families making difficult budgeting decisions are not forced to sacrifice internet access when online connectivity provides an essential lifeline to many services. Our inquiry in today's debate have highlighted a number of key areas where we may wish, as a committee and as a parliament, to undertake further, more in-depth scrutiny in the future. We thank the Scottish Government for its response to our report and look forward to receiving a response from COSLA and the UK Government to aid our discussions on next steps. In isolation, some of the Committee's recommendations might seem small, but collectively they could make a significant improvement to people with low incomes who are trying to manage problem debt. But change will require cooperation between local authorities as well as the Scottish and UK governments. Change will require us to listen to people's experiences on the ground with compassion and empathy. For change, we need to reach out to people and offer support and not always expect them to know where to go and what to ask. As one debt advisor told us during our inquiry, a lot of people fall into debt due to a change in circumstances like a relationship breakdown, bereavement, losing a job or having a child. People don't decide to spend, spend, spend and then be in debt. The idea of willful debt is a myth or certainly in the clients that I see. This is not fear. There should be no stigma to being in debt. Everyone deserves the opportunity for a fresh start. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Ms Don. That concludes the debate on robbing Peter to pay Paul, low income and the debt trap. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. Point of order, Alex Gohamilton. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I would like to seek your guidance on the procedures surrounding the correcting of the official report. On the 29th of September, the First Minister told the Chamber that under this government, we have a position where our net energy consumption is already provided by renewable energy sources. That is, of course, not true. Indeed, Liam Kerr raised a point of order at the end of FMQs, asking whether the record would be corrected. However, outside this chamber, it's the statistics that, that has been misrepresented before. The First Minister said on the 1st of November 2021, we virtually decarbonised our electricity supply, just short of 100% of all the electricity we use is from renewable sources. John Swinney, on the 7th of September this year, said, We've now got 100% self-sufficiency in our electricity requirements from renewables. Ian Blackford, the same week, said almost 100% of our entire electricity production comes from renewables. I, of course, appreciate that those further examples are not matters within the Deputy Presiding Officer's purview, but I do believe it is of relevance that there is a pattern of misrepresenting this statistic. It's a statistic that is at the very heart of the issue of Scotland's energy security, and therefore one that is of relevance to the energy bills of millions of people in these uncertain times. The Ministerial Code quite clearly says it is of paramount importance that Ministers give accurate and truthful information to the Parliament, correcting any inadvertent error at the earliest opportunity. Ministers who knowingly mislead the Parliament will be accepted to offer their resignation to the First Minister. Point five of the guidance on the correction of inaccuracies on, providing, uh, on information provided in parliamentary proceedings states that if a member realises after an item of bus business has ended that a significant error has been made, for example, one which may affect the conclusions which listeners would draw from the debate, which I believe matters here, the member may ask to make a statement during the next available plenary session. That is in addition to the steps outlined in point nine, which include writing to the presiding officer, 
and the member who drew attention to the need for correction. Can I therefore ask Deputy Presiding Officer on two points. Firstly, on what date the correction was made by the First Minister to the official report, and secondly, whether the opportunity to provide a statement to this Parliament regarding that correction was requested by the First Minister. Um, I thank Mr Cole Hamilton for his points. As the member knows, if any member realises that they have provided incorrect information in the Chamber, the member can request a correction to be added to the official report. I understand that that indeed has happened in the instant case. The guidance also sets out the steps that should be taken to make other members aware when a correction has been made. It is the responsibility of the member making the correction to ensure such steps are taken. On another point that the, the member raised, I am not aware of whether there has been any request to make any statement. And in broad brush, I would say that the adequacy or otherwise of parliamentary rules of procedure are not, of course, a matter for the chair, but rather are, of course, a matter for the parliament as a whole. Thank you. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 6557 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on changes to tomorrow's business. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now. And I call on George Adam, Minister, to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 6557 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed, and the motion is therefore agreed to. There is one question to be put as a result of today's business, and the question is that motion 6374, in the, the name of Elena Whittam, on behalf of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee, on robbing Peter to pay Paul, low income and the debt trap be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed and the motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and we will now move on to members' business. I ask members who are leaving the chamber to do so quickly and quietly. Thank you. <laughs>